There are plenty of games with a cult following, but few developers come out with as many cult following games as development companies like Grasshopper manufacture. Games like Killer7, No More Heroes, Let It Die, even bizarre games like Michigan Report From Hell have cult followings because of their bizarre art direction, usually led by the creative mind of Suda51. And with James Gunn, one of the writers and directors behind Guardians of the Galaxy, Dawn of the Dead, Suicide Squad, and wait a minute. Scooby-Doo 2, Monsters Unleashed, man, he did both the Scooby-Doo live-action movies? Oh, I love this guy. With all these people on board, it's probably unsurprising that they managed to make an incredibly unique game that even to this day, if you go to a comic book or anime convention, you're almost guaranteed to see a cosplayer from this IP. Lollipop Chainsaw. The game sold only a million copies worldwide, which sounds like a lot of games until you realize that the Call of Duty franchise has sold almost half a billion as of 2021. With a pretty lukewarm reception from game journalists, what happened with Lollipop Chainsaw? We're going to go through the game and experience the sheer and absolute madness of what happens when a Japanese studio decides to make a game about an American teenage cheerleader. The game starts out as your stereotypical American teenage movie. Our main heroine, Juliet Starling, is late for school and it's her birthday, so she wants to meet her boyfriend, Nick. She soon realizes, though, that the entire San Romero High School has turned into the shambling undead. Although, they're still able to talk and quip funny one-liners. These beings still only have one desire, and it's to eat you and all of your classmates. Combat is as basic as basic comes, eventually being expanded upon a little. Heavy attacks with the chainsaw either high or low, a dodge, and then the pom-pom bash where Juliet will cheer zombies to death by smacking them with paper. The non-chainsaw attacks being for setting up enemies into a groggy state so you can one-shot them with a chainsaw. We tear our way through a few hordes of zombies, learning the basic mechanics, how if you hit multiple zombies with a killing blow you get extra coins and a rainbow animation. Funnily enough, this exact mechanic would be the inspiration of Harley Quinn's vision in The Suicide Squad, the way she sees violence as flowers bursting from people's wounds. It's not quite the same as how it looks in this game, but I think it's really funny that almost a decade later this game is still making a cultural impact because James Gunn remembered and really liked the way that Juliet saw violence. We learn soon that lollipops are going to be Juliet's HP during the course of the game, and after almost getting run over multiple times by school buses and once by a guy in a van, Juliet saves multiple students and the pilot lets her know that he'll pick her up nearby, only to have zombies get on board the helicopter crashing it and destroying our escape plan. Julia gets a call on her chainsaw phone. Don't do anything stupid, okay. Yeah, mom, I, I won't do anything stupid at all. After the call, we encounter the Chop to Shop, a shopping website where you can spend all the coins that you've received up to this point. This ranges from new combo moves, health upgrades, health consumables alongside new outfits, art, and even unlocking MP3s of songs to listen to, which you will hear none of in this video because of copyright claims, obviously. Seriously, every song in this game is an absolute banger. All the songs are fantastic, from metal to classic songs like Lollipop from the 1950s. We fight towards the school though and are met with some more aggressive, tougher named zombies. These include hazmat zombies that shoot a poison breath at us and are generally just harder to bring down, with a massive tank that won't explode but will hurt us if they get a chance to swing at us. After dealing with them, we kick open the door of the school and make our way inside to find our boyfriend Nick. Nick saves us from a zombie approaching from behind only to be bitten on the arm for his trouble, infecting him with the zombie virus that will eventually turn him into another member of the living dead. Despite this, Nick is only concerned with our well-being. Being held in Juliet's arms in his final moments, Nick is just sad that he ruined her birthday. He confesses his love for Juliet and passes out, beginning to turn into one of the undead. Ready to enter oblivion, Juliet has the ultimate Jimmy Neutron brain blast, realizing, wait a minute, there's something that we can try here, and she takes the only natural course of action. She cuts off Nick's head, somehow keeping him alive in the process with a magical ritual, and reveals to Nick that she is a zombie hunter, attaching Nick to her skirt while he'll be remaining as her unfortunate tag along for the rest of the game. Fighting our way out of the classroom and making Nick somehow want to throw up from nausea, we realise the school is starting to collapse. We save some students, taking out one of our old teachers in the process, having to leapfrog over him and attack from behind to do any damage to him, before a zombie strapped with C4 blows a hole in the hallway. Police are already on the scene, but they're very quickly being overwhelmed. Next, we find a headless zombie, and Juliet urges that she needs to place Nick on it, allowing him to temporarily gain magical powers and use the zombie to do a variety of different things like blasting holes in walls or helping Juliet onto higher up places. Personally, I don't really know why Juliet couldn't do this herself, but I guess she just wanted to encourage Nick. She's really enthused about the whole thing, cheering on Nick as his lifeless body shambles towards the wall you need to break. We then learn about a new mechanic for combat, Nick Roulette. 
By spinning the wheel, we can use special magical abilities with Nick. The first one being that we attach Nick to a string and spin him around like a flail. We save another student and then we are attacked by a zombie police officer with a gun. The zombies can use guns in this game. After almost being run over by a bus and having to tear down the wall to halt it, we make our way into a classroom that has a pole in the center, showing us that Juliet can spin on the pole with her chainsaw, attacking everything that approaches her from any angle. This is just one of the many throwaway mechanics that pops up into the game. So far the game is a lot of fun and it has a lot of character, but one thing I do notice about it is that it tends to bog itself down with showing you a new mechanic. When I think through the entire course of the game, there was maybe four or five poles to spin on to actually take out zombies. As it turns out, Juliet was taught at the school of Hocktone No Ken and possesses the feet of the North Star, I guess. Leaping across all the zombies, we land and let them know that they're already toast. We enter into the school's gymnasium where we have to go against the San Romero zombie basketball team, having to score 100 points worth of zombie heads put into the basket. All the while, there are zombies blocking shots left and right, and after a while, cheerleaders enter and despite having their legs cut off, they just handstand towards you to attack regardless. We score our points, the exit doors open and we continue, bringing us into a lecture hall where we shake Nick's head like a piggy bank, collecting all of the coins within and smashing our way through. We enter into the cafeteria to meet our teacher, Morikawa, who shreds a group of zombies and tells us that the universe is actually three different dimensions. And using magic and explosives, the rotten world has begun to seep onto Earth, and we have to stop whoever is responsible. We split up from our teacher, and we make our way to the downstairs cafeteria. When we get down there, it turns out someone has made a birthday cake for a Juliet, but it is packed with TNT. And our new goal is to stop fire zombies from reaching the cake, or we detonate the whole school. After a bunch of bomber zombies get wheeled into the cafeteria, we barely make it out alive and are confronted with a culprit behind the bomber zombies, Swan, a goth geek. Swan is sick of the school and he performs a dark ritual and Morikawa tries to stop it but is easily knocked away. The summoned dark forces swarm around Swan, commanded to rot the entire school and converting the entire population of the town into zombies. A punk zombie called Zed is summoned, shouting so hard that it blows us away. We land in a junkyard and when we stand to get our bearings we realise it's been converted into a punk concert hall. Fighting our way down to the stage he uses his voice to shoot projectiles at us forcing us to dodge, slash through cars, and destroy undead to get down there. The undead here are cool, and they actually hardcore dance. The characters make reference to My Chemical Romance, and I just think that it's really nice. It shows that the people who made the game actually kind of understand the culture just a little bit. I can't believe that a zombie hardcore dancing like this is something I appreciate. I've, I've been to plenty of hardcore shows over the years, and never once have I danced like this, but it's really cool. We finally make it to the stage and to our first major boss fight of the game. Zed dashes around shooting stage wide sound effects at us and trying to spear us with his microphone stand. After dodging and slashing him as much as possible, we finally cut him in half, although that just makes him hornier. Amps fall from the sky and we enter into phase 2 of the boss fight. During this phase we have to smash all of the amps around the area whilst trying to dodge blasts of sound and then after clearing all of the amps and leaving Zed absolutely nowhere to jump to, he brings down a gigantic speaker that we have to cut through whilst Zed screams at us. Finally, going into the final phase after cutting him up again, we have to make it to the centre of the arena while Zed screams as hard as he can, making the entire area a death trap. Thankfully, it doesn't do too much damage and we're able to push through to the centre of the stage and we finally slice up Zed for good, purifying the area and killing the first of a group of five that we learn are called the Dark Purveyors. It turns out the entire school is probably done for, all of them having been turned. Our teacher tells us all this in his dying breath. Oh, I have this for you, Juliet. <coughs> Happy birthday, Juliet. <coughs> Sensei! He enters the elevator to heaven and we're now gifted with a new chainsaw and the task of doing what our teacher failed to do. Our next destination is the school's football stadium. Nick complains about being a decapitated head for a bit, whilst above a viking ship led by the drummer of the dark purveyor soars overhead, calling lightning to the ground, trying to take out Juliet. We see Juliet's sister Cordelia in the distance clinging to the underside of the ship, who sends down a birthday gift for Juliet before being taken off into the distance. We now learn a new technique with Chainsaw Dash that lets us take ramps like a car by sticking our chainsaw into the ground, and unsurprisingly, we fight through zombies who were once members of the football team here, much tankier and much harder hitting zombies than we've fought so far. The baseball team try to get involved as well, but after we deal with them, we open up the way and head into the crumbling stadium. After getting slapped around by the football team, doing a billion finishers to take out crawling zombies and using Nick's head as a fireman to clear the way, we see Cordelia's present floating out through the window. 
So we dive out after it. It's worth mentioning at this point that the ability Nick Shake is broken. If you spend 30 coins for a ticket at the shop, you can get like 100 coins back and you can use this every so often. You can't just spam it, but it is so worthwhile. It's insane. After chainsaw dashing across the rooftops, another basketball court with some zombies is waiting for us. This one is way harder than the first one, but regardless, after getting a bunch of coins, we dash across the rooftops, we dodge timed explosives until we land inside the stadium's gym, complete with zombies running on treadmills. And you know what? They're kinda cute. Grandma crashes in to cause some havoc, but unfortunately I use my powered up chainsaw to literally just one shot her and move on. Later, a group of cheerleaders have three different people cornered, and the cheerleaders are funnily enough probably our hardest fight yet. Trying to balance taking care of them whilst also not letting the people get murdered was tougher than I thought. And even when you take their legs off, they are so mobile and they are so quick to dodge attacks. Saving all three of them though gives you some interesting thanks from the people that we saved. Oh my god, Easter egg! Oh. I need another tampon. Girls in Kenya have big butts. So we use the vaulting box to get onto the roof above and we make our way through more football zombies before big jumping into the next area. In that area is much of the same thing except you have to juggle fighting tough zombies alongside dodging lightning crashing in from the sky which is really easy to be overwhelmed by and gives you not a lot of time to move away from the lightning coming in and the fireballs that are being shot at you constantly. If it wasn't for the fact that I have been neck shaking for coins constantly and put quite a lot of my money into HP increases, there's every chance I could have been in trouble here. With that, we jump to grab our birthday present from the air, adding a grenade launcher to our chainsaw's arsenal and putting us in the baseball field. This section is a baseball minigame where we stick Nick's head on a zombie and he is forced to make three home runs whilst we defend him from both baseball zombies and cheerleaders. Somehow, not the most strange part about this game so far. It's a good tutorial to teach us about how powerful our new chainsaw blaster is though and I imagine that it will come into play a little bit later. For now though, we finally meet up with Juliet's sister Cordelia and she is introduced to Nick which is soon interrupted by the next boss raising through the roof. We're literally thrown by our sister into the sky to land on top of the flying viking ship the next boss being almost a confusing combination of pirate and a viking like their accent is so strange but this is vike regardless you've got a lot of gall sitting foot on this ship step by this first phase has us shooting him when he puts his guard up otherwise we get stunned because he's channeling electricity so it's a balance between attacking him with the chainsaw when he's open and shooting him when he has his guard up after we cut him in half he apparently does not care about that one bit. Now having a completely untethered floating upper body and a war body that isn't doing much, our blaster is way more important in this phase, occasionally having to dodge his war half flying in dynamic entry style. We eventually cut his head off, which then grows a hundred times its size and starts firing laser beams at us. Despite that, we keep firing at him when we can and eventually we're able to slice his head to pieces, finishing up the second major boss of the game. From here, we're moving on to stage 3. Waking up in a farm, we realise Nick has regained his body and turned into a zombie. The scene shattering into what turns out to be a hallucination from Juliet. Crashing in on a school bus is Rosalind, Juliet's little sister, and Nick sums up the entire game so far. No! No way, this is all totally normal. Rosalind throws her birthday present at us before careening off into the distance in the out of control school bus, giving us the Nick Popper. We run through the level to find Rosalind still dealing with an out of control school bus covered in zombies which we have to clear and send Rosalind soaring into a nearby patch of trees. The Nick Popper loads Nick's head into a cannon that can immediately stagger zombies, letting you get easy one hit kills. It doesn't seem that great though for now so we probably won't be using it all that much. After a battle with the zombie Colonel Sanders and zombie chickens and some zombies levitating by shooting blood out of their legs like one of those water jetpacks. We continue the chase to meet up with Rosalind, protect our bus from falling rocks, and eventually cut a mushroom, sending us into another hallucination. This time, you guessed it, we get to fight the big chicken. Juliet starts freaking out trying to find Rosalind, but eventually finds herself on top of some farming equipment after exiting the hallucination. Of course, we turn on that combine harvester and use it to mow down a hundred zombies in the weirdest non sequitur scene ever. Like, you exit the hallucination in a loading screen, you mow them down, and then you straight away enter another loading screen and go back to regular gameplay. After that, we go through some more escort mission style stuff before entering another hallucination. This time with three giant chickens that when you kill them, turn into one giant mechanical chicken hydra. This is a terrible fight, 
Uh, you can't attack if you're too close to it, and it took me way too long to figure out I was doing no damage. I spent literally like seven minutes standing next to it, waiting for it to come down, because it does not always leave itself open, and it turns out I was just too close to do damage to it, which is bizarre. After that, we do another Combine Harvester section, this time with 300 zombies to kill and scarecrows tied to explosive barrels that do a lot of damage if you drive into them. I'll admit, this section kind of rubbed me the wrong way. Going from just loading screen to Combine Harvester, back to loading screen over and over again. I mean, this is the second time that we've done this and it's just adding a bigger number. But we never see the Combine Harvester or any of its mechanics ever again and it just seems like a bit of a time sink. Maybe it was because I just had to deal with the giant chicken boss that took me forever to do, but it just seemed a little bit strange. After that, we have a big fight with a lot of zombies. Really, really satisfying here to use our super mode to take out dozens and dozens of them in just a few strikes. Then we finally meet up with Rosalind, and it turns out she's gone kind of mad, all thanks to the next major boss of our game. The guitar playing member of the Dark Purveyors who has our sister captive. This is Mariska and her fight is actually really really cool. It entirely relies on you using the chainsaw blaster. First to blast away her shields and then when you cut her in half she splits into two and then into four different beings. All of a sudden you have combine harvesters trying to run you down, the giant chicken heads trying to peck at you to death and then bubbles are trying to mess you up the entire time. The third phase she splits again and again and again pulling out some crazy visuals and a giant hand that chases you and tries to slap you but otherwise it's just the same thing it was still a really cool boss fight it definitely made up for some of the less good parts of the previous level but the visuals of that fight alone were so much better than any of the previous two bosses we fought so far but finally we take her out and that's the third member of the dark purveyors laid to rest we get a phone call from t-pain why are you pretending to be Stephen Hawking? I got the freaky little super freak right here. Finally, we're introduced to Juliet's dad. Juliet's dad looks like Evil Knievel and makes it clear to Nick that anyone dating Juliet has to become a zombie hunter too, which, given the fact that he is a disembodied head, doesn't really make him of any tremendous amount of value. With the plan drawn up though, Dad gives us a present for Juliet's birthday after being brought to tears by how much of a tactical genius his daughter turned out to be. Then he proceeds to scale the building like, what, what on earth, what, 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 what? So we head into the arcade after getting our new Nick Roulette move, Nick Shoot, which is really not great. I've basically only ever been using Nick Shake at this point. I have found absolutely no need to use any of the other Nick Roulette moves. Taking the elevator up, we enter into a game of Pac-Man with the boss controlling these massive monsters chasing us around the arena. We can grab stars and use our special super chainsaw abilities to kill the monsters. Otherwise, we just grab our keys and we exit through to the next stage. After saving a couple more people, we enter an arcade cabinet. This turns the game into more of a Streets of Rage type beat where it's a little bit more 2D. All we have to do is climb to the top of this to beat the level. After we get out, we head into a room with a stripper pole and we fight some more hordes of zombies and then we enter into yet another arcade cabinet. This time, it's Pong. We have to fight off enemies to reduce the size of the enemy's paddle so we can actually score a goal. After we score a goal, we're able to exit and we make our way onto the roof. We destroy a helicopter and then go into yet another arcade game that makes you scale a building. This was the hardest part of the game so far for me. I have not died once in the game at this point, but uh... Like, there was just something about it that just, I, my brain was not computing. I get it, I'm, I'm dumb, but like, l l listen. Once we finish off this arcade cabinet, we finally get to meet the guitar player for the dark purveyors in a bizarre disco scene. This is Josie. Josie is the funk zombie and I love everything about his design. He rides a UFO blasting around the boss arena, shooting lasers at you and asking you one simple question. Are you retarded? Yeah, I don't have a clue. You have to try and lay some damage on him when you can and then some stairs will spawn letting you get some access to ammo to start blasting damage into him with your chainsaw blaster. After you get him to 0 HP, you cut him up, transporting you to the top of a UFO flying in space. From there, you have to destroy all of the antenna around the outside of the UFO, whilst avoiding getting electrocuted and as well as that, avoiding the floating skulls that are coming at you. Once all of these are down, it lowers the force field on Josie's cockpit and you slice straight through it, hesitating after realizing that your sister Rosalind is actually on the underside of the UFO and if you take out Josie, then it will take everyone else out with him. 
Josie mocks you for believing that this would ever be a fair fight, despite him being the one that suggested it. Then, your dad grabs Rosalind, as you see on the camera, and Josie dies in one of the funniest evil guy realizing that he messed up cutscenes ever. <laughs> With that, the arcade is done and we're on to the final stage, the unfinished cathedral. Almost all the family are here now, finally. And whilst Nick is used as a ball by Rosalind, a plan of attack is created by Dad, preparing to take on the final dark purveyor. Nick at this point has lost the will to live, and with a fresh new makeover, praying someone would kill him, he's taken by Julia against his will into the final stage. We go through a really cool long survival section and a massive long section where Cordelia helps you push through, giving you some cover from above, but then eventually we jump into a demolition site and Rosalind has somehow managed to get access to a crane with a wrecking ball attached to it. You have to defend her from zombies, make sure that she doesn't get overrun by them, while she tries to friendly fire you with the goddamn wrecking ball constantly. Every time you get downed in this game, you have to spam circle to get back up. So when you're in a fight where th there's just a, a giant ball knocking you over constantly when you're trying to aim at things, dear lord. Now, I'm not a big fan of elevator sequences where you have to fight on elevators, but I will admit this one does actually have a pretty cool twist on it. See, this elevator has a weight limit, so you actually have to take out the zombies fast enough before the weight limit gets too high or it will bring the entire thing down. Once we've ridden the elevator, we get inside the cathedral and our dad appears, sparking a giant Rude Goldberg machine that smashes a massive hole in the floor. He wishes Juliet the best of luck and she dives into the hole, ready to face the final battle. Dropping down into the boss arena, she's soon peppered with bullets by Lewis, the final member of the Dark Purveyors. He circles the area on his motorbike, but with some good upgrades on my weapon, getting extra damage, as well as having some pretty good combos that actually hone in and do multiple attacks, this part of the fight was not particularly difficult. We cut his legs off and then he turns into an elephant motorcycle mech. We've upgraded her HP and her damage so much at this point that it's really not all of that big a deal. And after we cut the mech up a little bit, it turns into a kind of more motorbike style elephant, but it's still an elephant. The motorbike is much faster, but once again, we are far too powerful at this point. And after cutting both the lines on either side of his car, finally he enters the final phase and he is fast as hell. He blasts across the room and we have to chase after him for a pretty decent amount of time. Despite the fact he's not actually posing any major threat to us, this is just completely an inconvenience. Still, Lewis is finally killed and we finally get our chance to confront the final villain, who lets us know that us killing all of the Dark Purveyors was actually part of the Dark Ritual. And with the death of Lewis, that ritual is now complete because they all uttered some sacred words upon the time of their deaths, forming a pentagram across the entire school. With his plan complete, Swan puts Lewis's gun to his own head and pulls the trigger. Although this isn't the end of him, Swan monologues about how the entire school rejected him and made fun of him because he was different and because of that, he wants the entire world to rot. Dark energy collects, forming a giant gelatinous goop in the cathedral and a giant head passes the window, turning out to be a massive skyscraper sized Elvis impersonator, Killabilly. Now, the final true boss is here. As we get down onto the streets, seeing Killabilly at the end of the street, Julia gets a call from beyond the grave from her old teacher. Killabilly starts throwing cars at you and you have to deflect the cars to form a bridge. All the while, Dragon Force plays. I really wish I could play the music for you. I, I think I'm gonna risk it because it's it's so awesome. Chainsawing cars away from you that are being thrown at you down this really cool set piece of a level all the while Dragon Force is blasting in my ears. Okay, you, you, look, just listen. After we get to the end of the street, we finally enter the Killabilly fight, and Killabilly tries to kill us in a way that is only fitting of the final boss of a game. He tries to run us down with a Ford Wrangler. After doing enough damage to him, we're able to ride up his arm, and we're knocked down before we're about to be face lasered. Our dad rides in on a motorcycle and makes the ultimate sacrifice, pulling the pin on a grenade and blowing a gigantic hole in Killabilly's face taking himself out in the process. Juliet is heartbroken, but with Nick's encouragement, he convinces her to dive into Killabilly's body to end this once and for all before the hole closes and Juliet's dad's sacrifice was in vain. Inside of his body, we need to find the core. Our sensei tells us that we have to take control of this core in order to destroy him and all the rotten souls on Earth. The only way to do that, though, 
is with a Nick bomb, attaching him to the body of Swan and causing him to detonate himself, saving everyone in the process. Nick agrees this is the only way to save as many people as possible and Juliet places him on Swan's body, destroying Killabilly completely. Nick wakes floating in space, with Juliet's teacher saying that he will be blessed with a reward, although there has been a mix up with the whole reward thing and that he wants to make sure, well... In my memory, have Juliet do plenty of cartwheels while wearing those little white panties with the teddy bears. <laughs> Nick calls out to Juliet on Earth, realising that he has returned in a body, although it's the body of Juliet's teacher being a good three foot shorter than he was originally. Juliet and Nick couldn't care less though and are about to embrace when Juliet's sisters show up alongside their father who survived the blast, claiming to have only lost a testicle and that it doesn't really matter because he only needs one anyway. The family walk off into the sunset surrounded by the completely level and barren wasteland that was once their town, Juliet exclaiming that this was the best birthday ever. From here, depending on what you did during the course of the story, you'll end up either seeing the good ending or the bad ending. This depends entirely on whether or not you saved every single student that needed help over the course of the game or if you missed even one. In the good ending, the entire family and Nick enjoy Juliet's birthday, sharing cake and laughter together before the cutscene closes out. In the bad ending, the Starling family get home happy to see their mother, only to realise that their mother has she herself turned into a zombie. And that's the end of Lollipop Chainsaw. If there's one thing that didn't miss over the course of this game, it's the art direction and the general vibe of the game. Everything it did, it did with full enthusiasm and whilst some of the sections kind of waned on me, and there was plenty of mechanics that were introduced to us that didn't necessarily serve a massive purpose or weren't actually used that much and to be honest the combat itself was a little bit bland as far as combat goes it's incredible to me that despite the fact that this game sold hilariously poorly worldwide let me remind you it sold a million copies across the globe that's not even in just japan that's not even in just america that's everything combined it makes the fact that basically every convention I've been to in the last decade, always having at least one person cosplaying Juliet Starling, uh, incredible. Just goes to show you how iconic characters from this game are. Most people knowing who the character is without ever having even watched gameplay of the game, never mind having actually played it. I had no idea what the game was like before this, but I knew who Juliet Starling was. I struggled to think of what could have made this game a little bit more appealing. There's a lot of fan service, there's a weird uncanny feeling that kind of happens whenever anime shows try to portray Americans, and a combat loop that feels like it can drag on a little bit. Particularly when after literally every single wave of enemies, you have to go through a many cutscene after many cutscene that directs you to the next fight. The farm was by far the worst offender for this, having to shoot away the rocks that threatened to crush Rosalind. The game would pause the action to direct the camera to make sure you knew it was coming and you knew you had to shoot it over and over and over again. This happened about 8 times and it was as if the game had absolutely zero trust in the player to know what was going on, both highlighting the rock and making sure it had a massive shoot symbol on it. The only good thing about the farm was the chickens and the boss fight, everything else I really could have done without. Still, for a game on the PS3 and Xbox 360 that only lasts about 5 hours if you're not trying to collect everything, for it to feel like it's dragging is a bit of a danger sign. The game is clearly not trying to overstay its welcome, but it's almost as if they made an incredibly to the point game, realised that it was only about 2.5 hours long and then went back and put in extra content to help drag out the runtime a little bit so people felt like they were actually getting their money's worth out of it. I don't regret playing Lollipop Chainsaw at all though, and I definitely recommend giving it a try or whipping it out for another playthrough if you are one of the million people on earth that own it, as you can complete it in an afternoon. But if you're at this point in the video and you haven't played it already, well I kind of already spoiled all of it for you. Uh, but Hell, do you know any other obscure titles that barely anybody knows about but you think is the greatest thing ever? Let me know down below in the comment section and allow me to thank you and all the other kind gentle souls who have invested in this channel to help me produce content for you all to hopefully enjoy. If you want to see your name here, uh, then please consider subscribing to my Twitch channel or becoming a YouTube member down below. Otherwise, you watching is absolutely more than enough and if you're new here, subscribing to the channel, liking the video also helps me a great deal. Thanks for watching, have a wonderful day.